Hello everyone, welcome to Horror in Detail today we are going to share new Wendigo horror stories. First story, I found a treehouse in the middle of the woods. When we were kids, growing up in the small town of Harvest Ridge, we found a treehouse. It sat shrouded in the heart of the forest that our parents had always warned us about, the Whispering Woods. Our gang, consisting of me, Maddie, Sarah, and little Timmy, were always looking for adventure, and the allure of the forbidden was too much to resist. It was a crisp October afternoon, the time when the leaves were changing, painting the world in shades of gold and crimson. We promised to stay near the edge of the woods, but youthful curiosity is a powerful thing. The sight of the treehouse, nestled in the gnarled branches of an ancient oak, was the most magical thing we'd ever seen. Guys, think of all the cool stuff we can do up there. Maddie was the de facto leader, his bright blue eyes always full of mischief. Are you sure we should? Sarah, ever the voice of reason, asked, her brown eyes flicking between us nervously. Timmy just clutched his teddy bear tighter, his tiny body trembling. Ignoring their reservations, I stepped forward. Let's just check it out. We'll be back home before dinner. The climb was daunting, the wooden rungs creaking ominously under our weight. But when we finally scrambled inside, it was like entering another world. It wasn't the cozy din of childhood dreams we'd imagined. Instead, it was a stark, grim place filled with strange symbols etched into the walls, dark stains on the wooden floor, and an unsettling stone altar in the center. Guys, this doesn't look right, Sarah said, her voice a bare whisper. What's all this stuff? Maddie asked, poking at a pile of odd, bone-like trinkets. And then, Timmy screamed. He was pointing at a corner, where a crude drawing depicted a monstrous figure, surrounded by smaller, kneeling figures. Beneath the drawing were words, scrawled in a dark, rusty color. The chosen must feed the silent one. We left the treehouse quickly, fear replacing our initial curiosity. We promised each other we'd never go back, and for a while, we kept that promise. But then, Timmy went missing. The town searched, but found nothing. It was as if the earth had swallowed him whole. We were devastated, but a nagging thought lingered in the back of my mind. The treehouse. One night, unable to bear the guilt and the uncertainty, I snuck out and returned to the whispering woods. What I saw there still haunts my dreams. The treehouse was glowing, a sickly green light pulsating from its windows. Hushed whispers echoed around the woods as cloaked figures shuffled into the treehouse. I hid, watching in horrified silence as the ritual unfolded. Their leader stood by the altar, a familiar teddy bear in his hands. The silent one demands. The chosen shall answer, he intoned, and the woods seemed to shiver in response. I ran, the image seared into my brain. The treehouse wasn't just a treehouse. It was a sacrificial altar, and we'd walked right into it. We'd given them their chosen. I told the others. We told our parents, the police, anyone who would listen. They didn't believe us, of course. They searched the woods and found nothing. The treehouse was gone, as if it never existed. All that remained was an empty clearing and the echo of our guilt. The town declared Timmy a lost cause, a heartbreaking mystery that would never be solved. The rest of us were sent to therapists, told we'd invented the whole thing as a way to cope with the trauma. But we knew the truth. Weeks turned into months, and then years. We grew up, but the shadows of our childhood lingered. We never spoke about Timmy or the treehouse, but it was always there, a silent specter haunting our lives. I eventually moved away for college, the need to escape Harvest Ridge overwhelming. But, like all nightmares, it drew me back in. Maddie, 
the spark in his eyes long extinguished, called me late one night. We found another one, another treehouse, he whispered, his voice trembling, in another forest on the other side of town. My heart sank. Maddie, we can't, we can't go through that again. I think, I think I saw Timmy, he said, and the line went dead. Coming back to Harvest Ridge was like walking into a ghost of my past, a snapshot of a time that was both innocent and horrifying. The town was still the same, save for the haunted looks in the eyes of those who remembered what had happened. And Maddie, he was still there, rooted in our shared past, unable to escape the shadow of the treehouse. As for Sarah, she had severed ties with us shortly after we burnt the original treehouse. The trauma of what had happened, the loss of Timmy, it was all too much for her. She moved overseas, seeking solace and distance and disconnection. Her absence was a palpable void, a missing piece in our fractured group. With the news of the second treehouse, I had tried to contact her, but my calls went unanswered. It was clear she wanted nothing to do with Harvest Ridge or anything that reminded her of our shared past. I couldn't blame her. If I could have escaped it all, I would have. But Maddie was here, and I couldn't leave him to face it alone. The sight of the new treehouse sent shivers down my spine. It was an eerie mirror of the first one, nestled in the foreboding branches of an ancient tree. The silence around it was suffocating, the air heavy with an unseen dread. The pulsating glow of the symbol seemed more potent, more threatening. It was as if the treehouse was alive, breathing, waiting. We were no longer the naive, adventurous children who first discovered that cursed treehouse. We were adults now, forged and hardened by the fires of our past. Our hands, once used for climbing trees and playing catch, now held cans of gasoline and bags of salt. We had done our research, read up on rituals and ancient cults, anything that might give us an edge. This time, we weren't going to be victims. We were going to fight. We waited, hidden in the underbrush, our hearts pounding in sync with the ominous drumbeat that echoed from the treehouse. One by one, the cloaked figures emerged and disappeared into the night, leaving the eerie glow of the treehouse behind. Maddie was the first to move. He approached the treehouse with a grim determination, his jaw set and eyes hard. I followed, every fiber of my being screaming at me to turn back. But we had come too far. We had to end this. Stepping into the treehouse felt like stepping into a nightmare. The symbols, the altar, the heavy air of malevolence. It was all as we remembered. But in the corner, a small figure huddled. Timmy. He looked just as he did the day he disappeared. His clothes tattered and dirty. His teddy bear clutched tightly in his arms. But his eyes, they were different. They glowed with an ethereal light, as though some strange power had taken residence within him. When he saw us, he didn't cry or call for help. He merely pointed to a chilling message on the wall. The silent one is fulfilled. The chosen will return. With Timmy safely in our arms, we escaped the nightmarish treehouse. We poured gasoline around it, creating a perimeter with salt, before setting the entire place ablaze. We stood there, watching as the unholy monument to the Silent One was swallowed by angry flames. In the days that followed, we took Timmy to the hospital. He didn't speak or react, his glowing eyes the only sign of the otherworldly presence within him. His parents, overjoyed and terrified in equal measure, thanked us for bringing their son home. But we knew, deep down, that Timmy hadn't really come home. Not all of him. A month after Timmy's return, the hospital caught fire. It was a clear, calm night, with no sign of arson or electrical malfunction. Yet, the building burnt to the ground. 
an eerily familiar sight for Maddie and me. We rushed to the hospital, hearts pounding with a dread we knew all too well. The fire was relentless, an inferno that resisted every attempt to quench it. It wasn't until dawn broke that the flames finally died down, leaving nothing but ash and ruin in their wake. They never found any bodies, not a single trace of the patients or staff. The entire town mourned, but Maddie and I shared a silent understanding. The hospital, the fire, the missing people. It was all too familiar. It felt like the treehouse, the silent one, all over again. When we returned to the site of the burnt hospital, we found one thing intact amid the rubble. A small, burnt teddy bear. Timmy's teddy bear. And scrawled in the ash beneath it was a chilling message. The Chosen has awakened. Second story. My friend and I went hiking and I'm starting to think she never left those woods. My friend Samantha and I were so excited to take a road trip together to go hiking somewhere further from home. We've been talking about it since we graduated college a few years back and finally found the time. Well, she always made the time. It was mainly me that had trouble balancing work with anything else. Looking back now, I wish I had spent more of this trip focusing on Sam, the scenery, and being present in the moment. I wish I had been a better friend. Sam was the most excited for our trip. The week before we left, she was texting me about restaurants in the area, stuff to do. She made a Spotify playlist with both of our favorites so we could listen to seven hours worth of an eclectic mix of classic rock, pop, and black metal, and was marking trailheads we might enjoy on her Google Maps app. I felt bad for putting the trip off for so long. We got to catch up, explore, try cool food. We had a great trip up until our final hike. We're both in decent shape, and since we had the supplies and plenty of daylight, we decided we were going to try a longer, unpaved trail that went around this beautiful lake. It was the last hike of our trip, and we decided to take a more difficult and less crowded trail. Initially, it was a wonderful hike. The water was such a surreal shade of blue, and the pine trees and rolling hills were breathtaking. The air was thinner than we were used to, but so refreshing. As we hiked around one bend, I almost ran right into Sam's back. I had been falling behind focusing on placing my feet in exactly the right locations in the soft dirt, so I didn't go sliding down 20 feet to the shore. Sam stood frozen, a deer in front of her blocking the trail. As I approached with my backpack jingling and breathing heavily, the deer stood for a moment more, tilting its head sideways at me before darting back into the pines. She looked back at me, her face tight. Did you see that? The deer? Yeah, it was pretty magical. She gave a little laugh as she started up again, so we could both move on to the section of the trail that had sturdier footing. No, I mean something was wrong with that deer. It was way too comfortable around me, and I don't know if you could see or hear it, but it was drooling and making these weird sounds. We continued on in silence after that as we focused on our footing and the scenery, stopping every so often to take pictures. One time, when we were stopped, we heard rustling to our right, higher up on the hill. I got the bear spray out and held on to it. It seemed to be walking parallel to us roughly matching our pace. It sounded big, too. Eventually the hiking trail rose to meet the higher part of the hill, and I couldn't help but sigh in relief. I'd been so worried I'd roll my ankle and tumble down the mountain, so it was good to have more room so I wasn't walking right on the edge. Back in college I'd sprained my ankle badly but couldn't afford to see a doctor. It healed a bit oddly, and since then my left ankle has been iffy. After a while, I needed to sit for a moment. Walking uphill for an hour in addition to the 6,500-foot elevation, I was struggling. Maybe I'm also a bit more out of shape than I had been willing to admit to. Sam sat with me for a moment but then saw some wildflowers about 10 feet into the woods and left to go take a quick picture. 
With her gone, I felt a sudden chill. Something was watching me. Sam! I called out nervously as the rustling grew louder, and I gripped my container of bear spray tightly. It stepped out of the woods, and it was just a deer. Or, more specifically, it was the deer, the same one that Sam and had encountered. Now that she had pointed it out, I could see what she was saying. The deer had no issues approaching me. It was scrawny, walked slowly, but like it had a bit too much to drink, and it was definitely drooling. I jumped up and waved my arms at it, go away. I knew it was sick and the poor thing was confused and probably suffering but it creeped me the hell out. It cocked its head and seemed to be studying me, looking me up and down. It approached me and made some sort of gasping sound. It was opening and closing its mouth in a way which deeply unsettled me for some reason. Sam. She came running towards me from the woods, and when I turned back it had gone. Are you okay? What happened? The creepy deer was back. I know it sounds silly, but think it's been following us. I told her how it had been behaving. Do you think it's rabid? Poor baby, she said sympathetically. Possibly? Or, I wonder if it has CWD. Either way, we should probably let the park rangers know just in case. We had decided we'd stick together, but after a few miles, she ended up ahead of me again. She tends to inch forward to get pictures whereas I tend to walk past sights, then have regrets and double back to take pictures. I had walked back a bit and was sitting down angling my phone weirdly to try and fit the scene in front of me in the frame when I heard Sam's voice, but I couldn't make out what she was saying. Hey, I'll be right there, I said, my voice raised slightly, assuming she was talking to me. Then, she screamed. Sam. I stood up and tried to walk as quickly and carefully as possible. Her screaming changed from fear to agony, and it sounded like she was sobbing. I wasn't sure what happened, but I could tell she was scared and likely hurt. I suddenly realized I was still holding our only canister of bear spray. Against my better judgment, I started running as fast as I could and for a while I was making good time. But then my left foot landed a patch of soft dirt at the edge of the trail, my ankle rolled, and I was falling. I don't remember hitting the ground, but I remember opening my eyes, flat on my back, about 15 feet below where I had been standing. It was also dark outside. We'd started hiking at least six to seven hours before sunset. I tried to stand, but it was a struggle. I was confused, disoriented. Trying to get up was talking all my energy and focus. I had a deep feeling of dread I couldn't explain. As I started slowly moving upwards on my hands and knees, I tried to recall what had happened leading up to my fall. Sam sounded hurt. She was screaming. I had run after her, and then I fell. Sheet. Sam. I called her name, my voice hoarse, but no response. My phone was surprisingly only minorly damaged, but I had no reception. Luckily, since it had been buckled to me, I still had our backpack. I dug through it. We had first aid kits, but I figured I could patch myself up later. I didn't want to stay down here any longer than I had to. I found my knife and my headlamp. After about 20 minutes I had slowly and painfully ascended back towards where I had fallen from. My hands were raw and I could feel my right knee bleeding though my pants. I was trying to go slowly since I trusted my feet even less now and dizziness was starting to creep in, but panic and fear drove me forward. Once I made it back to the trail, I had to sit for a moment. I heard rustling behind me and felt a sudden pang of fear. Something or someone had injured Sam, and here I was sitting alone, injured, with my back to the woods, in the dark. I tried calling her name, in case it was her that I heard, no response. I stood up and started limping as quickly as possible towards the direction that I had last heard her scream. Luckily the ground had evened out because I could feel myself weaving unsteadily. 
I knew that something terrible may have happened to her but kept trying to keep that thought out of my mind. As my calls to her remained unanswered and it became harder to imagine a scenario in which she was okay, I felt my throat tighten and tears roll down my cheeks. I kept looking for her. I knew she wouldn't just leave me here. I think part of me knew then that she was gone. She would have been searching for me if she was okay. And even if she left to get help, I think they would have found me by then. Somehow, eventually I navigated my way to where I thought she had last been. I was hoping maybe if she was injured, she was okay and just out of it and confused like I was. My foot caught in the mud and I fell. Lights flashed behind my eyelids and I felt overcome with nausea. The light from my headlamp had greatly dimmed as it was now coated in mud and grime. I heard movement behind me. As the smell hit me, I realized the mud was dirt mixed with blood. I could taste it, mixed with the gritty texture, leaves covered with what was likely blood stuck to my face, and I felt something soft and wet under my shoulder. The rustling behind me became discernible as footsteps. I felt around for my knife, my bare spray, but instead felt something hard, sticky. I was certain I had just found out what happened to Sam and had a good guess at what was about to happen next to me. I felt no urge to get up as the footsteps got closer. I knew I couldn't outrun it. I closed my eyes trying to focus on something, anything else, not knowing if I wanted to see what was coming for me. The footsteps stopped and I could hear labored breathing coming from above me. I waited, and then as no blows came, I opened my eyes. It was Sam. She stood over me, breathing heavily from her mouth. She was covered in blood. Her shirt and pants were torn, but she was alive. I let out a relieved sob and then could no longer hold back the tears. Oh my God, I whispered. As I slowly moved to sitting, and then standing, I thought I had lost you. I pulled her close to me into a hug. She stood motionless, her arms at her side. She stuck to me where her shirt was still a bit wet. Dried blood covered the neck of her shirt and her midsection. Her hands, and unsettlingly, her mouth, were also smeared with blood. I could still hear her breathing heavily close to my ear. What happened? I asked as I released her. She stared at me, but didn't respond. I figured she was a bit traumatized. Frankly, I wasn't sure how she was up and standing at all after whatever had happened. She was a bit wobbly, but otherwise seemed to be able to walk. As we walked towards the car, she fell behind me, which made me nervous as I didn't want to let her out of my sight. She kept stopping, staring over her shoulder, while I tried to coax her forward. Eventually, after what felt like forever, we made it back. My ankle was killing me, but I had tried to move as fast as possible. Although the woods were eerily silent, I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. When we got to her car, I was debating if we should drive ourselves to the hospital or call 911. I had this feeling of terror that I couldn't shake. I pictured us making it all the way here to the car and then something breaking the windows, attacking us. I decided we needed to leave now. Do you have your keys? Do you think you can drive? I asked. She had an old Jeep pickup and was very sensitive about other people driving her baby. Plus, I wasn't sure I could drive us with my ankle as it was. She said nothing, cocked her head at me. I know, we look like we've been mauled by a bear. I caught myself and winced, feeling suddenly insensitive. She clearly had been attacked by something or someone. When she said nothing, displayed no emotion or reaction, I cautiously continued, but I have a bad feeling. I think we need to leave, like right now. I'd rather call for help when we're back on the main road, or just drive straight to the hospital. She remained motionless, staring back into the woods and I wondered if she lost her keys in whatever struggle she had. Luckily I had her spare with me. 
I unlocked the doors, and she continued to stand outside. I realized I would need to punish my ankle a bit more because she was far too out of it to drive. I slid in, but she remained motionless. Sam, get in. Please? Something is out here still. Please. She was licking her lips, staring back at me again. In the darkness, her blue eyes looked almost black. I limped back out of the seat and opened her door for her and had to guide her in. I buckled her in after she made no move to do so for herself. As we drove and headlights of passing cars illuminated the interior, I kept checking on her out of the corner of my eye. She was breathing in and out of her mouth and staring at me. I noticed now, in the better light that she was drooling. Hey, uh, how are you doing? No response, but she began opening and closing her mouth and making a wet gasping sound as she breathed in and out. Her breath reeked and her teeth were tinged pink. I don't have much medical knowledge, but I was worried she had a punctured lung due to the strange sound she was making. Hold tight, we're about 20 minutes from the hospital. Despite my ankle I drove as fast as I could, we made it in 10. As we pulled up, I helped guide her out of the car and walked behind her, steadying her. I noticed something. Her shirt was on inside out. It hadn't been this morning. Likely because of how we looked, they found rooms for us immediately in the ER. I had a bad sprain and a concussion and would need a few stitches, but it felt so good just to be out of those woods. I asked the nurse that came to check on me about how Sam was doing. I mentioned to him I'm not sure if she was attacked by an animal or a person. I mentioned what I had noticed about her shirt, and that we may have encountered a sick animal, in case any of that helped. When he returned, he was clearly distressed. Sam was gone. She hadn't appeared to be outwardly injured, strangely, but they had wanted to assess for internal trauma. However, the first moment they had left her alone she had just walked out, judging by the bloody footprints. It's been weeks and I haven't seen Sam since. Her mom hasn't either. She has been working with the police out here. They think Sam has a head wound and is just confused and will turn up in town eventually. But, a few days ago, I heard on the news that a partial skeleton was found on the trail we were on. Likely the victim of an animal attack, they said, and due to the condition of the body, they were asking for leads so they could use dental records to help identify the victim. This might sound crazy, but I think it's her they found. I don't know how to explain it, but I don't think Sam ever left those woods that night. It's my fault, and I don't know what that thing was that I drove into town. If you live in southern Colorado, please be safe. I'm sorry. Third story. How to survive camping. The Lady in the Woods I run a private campground. While my land is dangerous, it's generally manageable and we tend to get more ambulance call-outs for broken ankles and dehydration than some inhuman thing attacking a camper. Bad years, however, are a different story. It's like the unnatural world upends itself and its wild thrashing gives rise to horrible things that I never could have envisioned. Like spider zombies. The police officer is still alive. The spiders are spreading slowly, though we don't know if it's because of the treatments they're throwing at him or if this is just how it progresses. If you're new here, you should really start at the beginning and if you're totally lost, this might help. My brother took the family records home with him. He found something. There was a reference to a witch in the woods. My ancestor talked about being disappointed that she would set herself against the family and how they buried her beneath the tree. I've come across that letter before and assumed it was talking about, well, an actual witch, much like the time we had to deal with a sorcerer. And to be fair, it still could be exactly as it seems. This happened early in our land's recorded history, and it's possible this could have just been an ordinary person that picked up supernatural powers and didn't get along with my relative, who used that to justify killing her. Or it could be a lady with extra eyes. 
I think about how she killed my grandfather. Perhaps if my father was just a little crueler, he would have sought revenge. Perhaps he would have gone so far as to kill the lady with extra eyes and bury her bones and tell no one of what he did. Unfortunately, my brother isn't as organized as me so now my records are completely out of order and it's going to take a while to fix them. He claims the baby threw them all over the place. I told him I may not know a lot about babies, but I'm savvy enough to know his excuse won't work until she's a toddler. While interesting, it didn't help much with our current predicament. My plan was to go into the woods until I ran into something willing to help. There's a handful of entities out there that I had in mind. The dancers, the man with the skull cup, and the lady with extra eyes. Of course, I figured I could also get some assistance from the less usual sources, such as the fairy or maybe even the thing in the dark, since it's been willing to give advice in the past. I went down the road that ran by the thing in the dark so I could speak to it on the way to the deep woods, but I got no answer. That left me with wandering the deep woods, waiting for something that would deign to let me find it. I went alone. I thought about bringing the dogs, but that wasn't an option this time. They're kind of like fluffy wolfhounds, so they pick up debris from the forest all the time and have to get groomed regularly. Brian took the dogs to a different groomer than usual and they try to trim down the fluff a little and, well, Brian says it's just a bad haircut. I say they look like 130 pounds, poodles. Anyway, turns out he's a little more sensitive about the dogs than I thought and now he's sulking, so I decided to leave the dogs out of it. Besides, it might seem a little threatening to show up with the dogs. We do use them to drive creatures out of an area on a regular basis. After all, I was armed, however. I took my shotgun, charm vest, and knife. In addition, I had some specialized weaponry to deal with the spiders. No, it wasn't a flamethrower. I am not going to burn my campground down. It was two cans of spider spray that had been duct taped together so that they could be fired in tandem to cover a wide arc in front of me. The movies make it look so glamorous. The hero goes after the monster armed with a gun and a crowbar, sexily slathered in blood and grit. Which is reasonable. I don't think anyone could take a movie seriously that outfits the character in cargo shorts and a polo while carrying a jury-rigged bottle of bug spray and wearing a vest with winged penis charms. My hopes were on the dancers, as I was already too deep in debt to the man with the skull cup. Besides, he doesn't seem like the save others type, while the dancers do. I walked for most of the day, making a continuous loop through the deep woods. I strayed from the road as well, as while this can be dangerous, especially when our campground doesn't have many people and no one else is in the forest. I can at least recognize the signs of danger and it might entice the attention of creatures that don't like the road, such as the lady with extra eyes. A little bit before sundown I found myself with an eyeshot of bloodroot. They stretched out in front of me as a meandering path. The invitation was clear. I followed them as they wound between the trees, growing steadily thicker until they spread out into a carpet of bobbing white blossoms. I'd arrived at the lady with extra eyes house. A wisp of smoke curled out of the chimney and while the windows were shuttered, a thin line of light crept free around the base. The tree that was once a person lay dead in the backyard. It had split cleanly in two and fallen, the halves lying brittle and lifeless in the dirt. I took a deep breath and went up to the door of the house. She wouldn't have let me find her if she wasn't ready to talk. I didn't feel ready, myself, but I don't think there is a way to ever feel ready for this sort of thing. Like, hey, you tried to kill me, let's have a cup of tea and talk about our feelings. How does someone prepare for that? You just have to do it, I suppose, and hope for the best. Maybe that's why my brother and I have a strained relationship. We never really talked about the horse incident. I knocked on the door. The lady opened it almost immediately.
Clearly, she'd been waiting for me to work up the nerve to knock. We stared at each other for a moment on either side of the threshold. Her face seemed thin to me. Her multitude of eyes looked tired. One of them was sealed shut. I felt a little guilty for that. She wore the clothing I'd used to break the curse. It looked clean, but it was still a little uncomfortable to see her standing there, wearing grave clothes. Or perhaps it was awkward because the last time we saw each other she was trying to kill me. We've, uh, got trucks and chains that can haul that wood out of here, I said, jabbing a thumb in the direction of the tree. We could bury it him, or would a pyre be more appropriate? The lady just stared at me a moment, and I wondered if I said something rude. Then she stepped back and let the door hang open in an unspoken invitation. I followed her inside, after first leaning my shotgun against the outside wall. Yes, I know. I left my weapon outside. But I felt that if our friendship was to be salvaged, then I should make a show of good faith. Besides, I still had the knife on me, hidden beneath the charm vest. Perhaps she knew it was there, but it was at least less overt a weapon than the gun. I'll take care of the tree, she said as she went to the fireplace. You have enough to handle already. She took the lid off the teapot by the hearth and filled it with leaves while the kettle heated on the fire. I meandered through the room while she worked. Her tea was kept up on a shelf and I eyed it, trying to determine if she had a good amount or if I should run to the store for her. There were an assortment of cups as well, an eclectic mix, and at one end of the shelf sat a teapot. I'd seen it before. It had been sitting on the table, all alone, when I came to her house with the harvesters. Do you ever use this one? I asked, pointing at it. Oh, I use it. She laughed and took the kettle from the stove. I went to the table and she joined me with the teapot and we sat there and waited for the tea to finish steeping. We're having spider problems, I said delicately. This isn't something you planned while you were cursed? No, then. Do you know what's going on? Ido. She poured two cups and shoved one towards me. Drink, she urged. It'll help. I sipped at it. It tasted of peppermint, which was encouraging since I got a lot of people suggesting using peppermint to ward off spiders. I told her about the police officer, and she said she'd drop off a package at my house. Have him drink it every day for a week, she said. He'd feel sick at first, but eventually he'd start to feel better, and that would drive out the spiders. Drive out? I asked nervously. Yes, it would drive them out. They'd seek their own route, but if we wanted to pick where they exited the body, and she believed we would, then we could put a slit in his skin and they'd seek the open wound first. I must have looked a bit uncomfortable at this because she said she'd write down instructions and include them with the bag of tea. Am I going to need to do the same thing? I asked, pointing at my tea. She laughed and said that wasn't something I'd have to worry about. I suppose my pact with the man with the skull cup has gotten around, though I hadn't taken the lady with extra eyes for being in on the gossip. And the man with the skull cup doesn't seem to be the sort to stop by for tea, though I could be wrong about that, I suppose. Then I worked up the nerve to ask her about the chains. She didn't say anything. She just stared at her teacup, so I kept talking to fill the silence. I told her I'd found the bones of her ancestor, and that I believed that one of my ancestors had killed them. Was it because of the curse? I wasn't angry, I said. I understand how curses worked. The bad year had triggered it this time. But what about the other occurrences? How could we keep it from happening in the future? This is very like you, Kate, she sighed. I believe you'd like to be a decent person. You're just not very good at it. I didn't know what to say to that. It felt unexpected. I drank more of my tea to give me time to recover from the surprise at having something like that sprung on me so abruptly. Is this about Jessie? I asked. You sort of adopted her while you were chainified after all. No, 
It wasn't about Jesse. She'd had her chance at vengeance and failed. The scales were balanced now. She wasn't answering my initial question though, and I felt this was deliberate. I told myself that maybe she wasn't ready to talk about it. Maybe the answer was the curse couldn't be avoided, and she didn't want to dash my hopes. I changed the topic then, to the more important thing I wanted from her. I told her how I'd learned that the balance of the campground was in flux, and that sides were being chosen. I wanted her on my side, I said. It's a shame, really, she murmured. What is? That I'd have to die for someone else to claim the land. Old land did that to people. It made them a part of it, even the mortals that owned it. That had been the problem with my grandfather. He hadn't wanted to let go if, and only his death would release it to my parents. Are you saying that all this time I've been so reluctant to sell my land because it's got a hold on me? I asked, incredulous. Now let's not give it too much credit, she warned. You are very stubborn on your own. The man with no shadow might have one if he'd killed me when he had the opportunity. We both made that particular mistake, I thought. Instead, he wanted his victory to extend even past my death by controlling the person that inherited the land after me. Arrogance, perhaps, but the lady understood where it came from. This was a bad year, after all, even back then, for these things don't necessarily follow our calendar year. They all felt the hunger. Even you? I asked. Even me? She sighed. It'd be a lot simpler if I could just walk away, she continued. Not even be part of this anymore. Seed the land to someone else. Even another family member would be fine. Just anyone that didn't matter so much. Are you saying there's something special about my immediate family? I asked, stunned. No, it'd be easier if you didn't matter as much to me. I stood up and backed away. My head was spinning. I said I wouldn't help you ever again, she said. I meant it. It wasn't because of any deal or agreement or rules that bound her. It was the simple reality of the situation. It is a curse, she continued, also rising from her chair. She stood there with her head bowed, her fingertips pressed on the surface of the table. But sometimes it's a useful one. Sometimes I embrace it. You were wrong about the chains. They weren't my cage. They're my web. Comprehension dawned slowly in my unwilling mind. I took a single step backwards towards the door. Behind her, from the cracks in the walls and from the darkness between the cupboards came spiders, crawling out in ones and twos and then in a solid, slow wave that rippled its way towards where I was desperately backing away towards the exit. I disguised myself because I don't want to end up like my predecessor, the lady continued, not moving from where she stood. You found her bones, did you not? Your family did that. I learned from her mistakes. It wasn't personal, she continued, not like it had been with my grandfather. It's just everything on this campground was out to kill me and, well, the odds weren't good for my survival. She might as well beat them to it, and then if she had power, real power over the campground, think of what she could do with it. She'd protect my campers, she said, after I was gone. I'll give you something none of the others will give you, at least. She finally raised her gaze to where I was fumbling with the door handle, unable to tear my eyes off her. A head start. Then I ripped the door open, turned, and ran. I grabbed my shotgun from where it rested and ran with it close to my stomach. Perhaps I wouldn't be able to outrun the lady, I reasoned, but I could outrun the spiders. That'd give me only one threat to contend with and from what I'd seen while breaking the curse, a gun would work on her when she wasn't fully the lady in chains. I made it a little ways before I realized that something was wrong. My head continued to spin, but it wasn't getting better. In fact, it was getting significantly worse. I had to stop and lean on a tree, struggling with nausea that left my mouth dry and my skin cold. 
I checked behind me. She wasn't in sight. This was either a hell of a head start or... She wasn't pursuing me because she didn't need to. The tea was poisoned. I'd wanted so badly for her to be someone I could rely on that I'd forgotten the most important rule of old land. You can't trust that which comes from the forest. You can't trust the things that aren't human. I shoved myself away from the tree. I had to get to the house. I had to get to people, to where someone would find me. I had to get out of the deep woods. My breathing felt like it wasn't enough, like I couldn't bring enough air into my lungs. And my heartbeat felt so fast in my chest that I felt it would just collapse with exhaustion at any moment. I fell to one knee. Someone was coming. I raised my eyes and for a moment saw two figures approaching. My vision blurred and the light was too bright. I squinted and the figure resolved itself. Just as the man with the skull cup reached where I knelt, he stretched a hand down to grab my arm. I warned you, he said. I wanted to protest that he'd been real damn vague about it, to the point I wouldn't call it a warning at all, but he was pulling me to my feet and I leaned heavily on him, struggling just to stay upright. We almost made it out of the deep woods before the lady caught up. The man with the skull cup swore under his breath, and shoved me forwards. He yelled at me to keep going and dimly the words registered in my mind. Forwards. I just had to keep going forwards. I stumbled from tree to tree and then, I heard my name. I knew the person calling me. Didn't I know them? Hadn't I trusted them? Someone had told me to keep going, but my friend was calling my name. I turned, Unable to tell what was happening anymore as the poison wound its way through my body. The seconds seemed pieced together, loosely stitched, and I couldn't remember one moment to another. The man with the skull cup stood between me and the lady with extra eyes. A blanket of spiders crawled at her feet. He swept his cup in a wide arc, throwing the liquid out in a shimmering sheet. The lady cried out and raised an arm to cover her face and the spiders swarmed upwards, coating her body in a protective layer, and they hissed and curled up and died as the liquid hit them. What do you hope to accomplish? She shrieked at him. You don't even have a name. Neither do you, he snapped. I don't need one. There was a crack, like bones snapping, and dark shapes spread from behind her. Legs, I realized. Spider legs. Her body lifted into the air as the monstrous legs, their points like spikes, settled onto the earth. Her blouse was torn down the back from where they'd emerged from her flesh. The man with the skull cup swiped at her with his knife, steadily backing away as the spider surged towards his feet once more. Kate, he yelled. You better fucking be running for your life. She lunged at him. One of her legs slammed into the ground and intercepted his knife, the blade sticking in the chitin. Her human fingers closed on the cup he held in the other hand. I heard a crack, then my legs gave out, and I remember lying on my back in the leaves, staring up at the sky, and dimly I heard a woman scream in pain and rage. There were tears in my eyes and I wasn't sure why. It felt like when they told me my parents were dead. I was losing someone, I thought. Someone important to me. Then I passed out. I woke up in the hospital. It's a dated facility, so it's one where you don't get a private room. Two beds with a curtain. I was in the bed closest to the door. Beside me sat the old sheriff, and he straightened in his seat as I opened my eyes. He turned and buzzed for the nurse while I continued to take in my surroundings, trying to piece together what had happened. Then I looked at the window and realized I wasn't the only patient in here. The man with the skull cup lay in the other hospital bed. His skin was pale, his breathing was shallow, and sitting next to him on a table was his skull cup. It was split in two. Holy shit! I whispered, struggling to sit up. The old sheriff was quick to assist. Ole shit.
Your aunt saw him coming out of the woods with you over one shoulder, the old sheriff told me. The cup was already broken at that point, so I think whatever he saved you from must have been the one to do it. It was the lady with extra eyes. She's trying to kill me still. The old sheriff just grunted, but made no other commentary. He just finished telling me what happened. He'd collapsed before reaching your house. My aunt called the ambulance and when they'd arrived, she'd given permission for them to transport both of us, which would have allowed the man with the skull cup to leave my property, even though he really couldn't have done anything to stop them at that point. Then my aunt called the old sheriff and he had his wife drop him off here so he could watch over both of us until we woke up. The doctors weren't really sure what I'd been given, so they just flushed my stomach and treated the symptoms as they manifested. This is my fault. You want to save him, the old sheriff said. I feel I have to, I whispered. He's killed your campers. He killed your cousin. I know. I clutched at my head, as if that would keep the pain at bay. This isn't simple, you know. Nothing is black and white. I'm not really good. He's not wholly evil and the rules are all falling apart and I don't hardly know what to do anymore. A long silence. Well, the old sheriff finally said, if you feel you need to save him, then I'll try to help. Respectfully, sir, you already lost one leg. I can't ask for more. Ah, well, don't worry about the leg. Arthritis was going to get it if the lady didn't. Besides, you don't need both legs to shoot someone with a rifle. I don't deserve my friends. There was a knock at the door. The doctor crept in and furtively shut the door behind him. They were keeping this all quiet, he said. There would be no paper trail for the man with the skull cup. Nothing to indicate he'd ever been here. He handed me a chart and said I could keep it. Every test they ran. He seemed human enough at least from a medical perspective. But there was also no medical reason for him to still be unconscious. Here the doctor glanced nervously at the cup. I was released not long after. I think they didn't want to keep me, or him, around. The old sheriff drove both of us home. And yes, he was still unconscious, so we just dumped him in the back seat and then got Brian to help carry him inside my house. He's on the sofa in the living room with the broken cup on the table nearby. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do with him, but the hospital made it clear they weren't willing to keep something inhuman around. There was a bag of tea sitting on my porch when we arrived, so I guess this means she's still alive. It smells of peppermint. They're going to give it to the police officer, even though I told them it came from the same entity that tried to kill me. She's only after me they reasoned. Besides, he's going to die horribly and nothing seems to be working. So they're desperate enough to take the risk. I haven't heard back on whether there's been any improvement. I'm a campground manager and I'm so confused. I'm protecting someone that should be my enemy and planning to kill someone that should be my friend. But this is a bad year and I guess all the rules are in flux and everything can be rewritten even friendships. I wonder if my ancestor was friends with the lady's predecessor. I wonder if they were betrayed too, and if they had to make the same choice I'm having to make. Because I don't intend to die, and if it's going to be me or her, well, it's going to be her. The man with the skull cup hasn't woken up yet. It's been almost 24 hours now. I'm not sure how to help him, but at least now I understand what the man with the skull cup wants from me. The lady with extra eyes said it. Fourth story. The woods that hunt me. Hey, I don't even know where to begin. I feel like I'm losing my mind. I need to get this off my chest before something terrible happens. I can't keep living like this, constantly haunted by the guilt and the presence that has infiltrated my life. It all started eight years ago. My best friend, Jenna, and I were driving home after a night of drinking. We were young, foolish, and invincible. Or so we thought. Jenna was drunk and high, so she asked me to drive us home. 
I was also very drunk, but I thought I could manage the 15-minute drive. I was wrong. We hit a girl, Emma, who appeared out of nowhere in the middle of the road. We were in a panic, overwhelmed by the fear of the consequences. It was a rash decision born out of desperation. We decided to bury her body deep within the woods, hoping no one would find out. The guilt consumed me from the moment we dug that grave. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't escape the feeling that Emma's father, now living without answers, was suffering because of our actions. The weight of our secret was unbearable, and I knew I had to confess. I had to tell him what happened to his precious daughter, even if it meant facing the consequences of my actions. But Jenna, oh God, Jenna was terrified. She was paralyzed by fear and uncertainty. She insisted that we stay silent, that we let the years pass without revealing the truth. I could see the torment in her eyes, the guilt eating away at her soul, just like it was consuming mine. Yet she remained adamant, refusing to admit our involvement in that tragic night. Years went by, and the guilt only grew stronger. To make matters worse, news reached me that Emma's father had taken his own life. I couldn't help but feel responsible. The thought that our actions had driven him to such despair, that we had torn a family apart, was unbearable. But then, Jenna began experiencing strange occurrences. She said she was being followed, that she felt a constant presence lurking just out of sight. At first, I dismissed her fears as a product of our guilt-ridden minds. But as time went on, her terror escalated, and it became impossible to ignore. Jenna confided in me about her fears, about the feeling that someone or something was after her. And then, just like that, she vanished without a trace. Nobody knows where she is, and the police are baffled. But I know. I know that her disappearance is connected to that horrific night, to the secrets we buried deep within the woods. Now, I'm being tormented too. The unknown figure that Jenna spoke of has turned its attention towards me. I feel its presence lurking around every corner, in the shadows outside my window. It's following me, stalking me, and worst of all, it knows what we did. It knows the terrible secret we've been hiding for all these years. I can't escape the feeling that this figure, this malevolent force, is seeking revenge for what we did to Emma. It wants to make us suffer, to pay for the life we took that night. It won't stop until it has torn apart everything I hold dear. As I write this... I sit alone in my room, my eyes constantly flicking to the window overlooking the haunting forest. The trees stand tall and foreboding, their branches reaching out like skeletal arms. And there, emerging from the darkness, is the creature that has haunted my nightmares for months. It moves with an unnatural grace, its eyes glowing with a malevolence that chills me to the bone. I don't know what will happen next. I don't know if I'll survive this night, or if I'll meet the same fate as Jenna. All I know is that I can't run from my past any longer. The horrors that have befallen us are a consequence of our actions, and now it's time to face them head on. If you never hear from me again, remember my story. Remember the darkness that lies within the woods and the guilt that can consume even the strongest of souls. And if you ever find yourself driving through the night, remember the choices you make, for they have the power to haunt you until the end of your days. Goodbye. I can hear it at my door now, scratching, clawing its way into my sanctuary. I hope that my words reach someone, that they serve as a warning. Don't let the guilt eat away at you like it did me. Don't let the horrors of the past come back to claim you. I'm sorry. Emma. I'm so, so sorry. Fifth story. The rules of our woods. The path through the woods is so twisted and winding that it doubles back at some points, 
and at others you could cut out five minutes of walking if you were willing to race just a few hundred yards straight ahead. Nobody would, though. Don't be foolish. I have been walking for half an hour when I see a pair of cherries on the path, but not touching it. They appear to have fallen perfectly, so that their stems are held up gently by ferns. I duck down to examine the berries and find them almost perfect and I reach my hand to touch it when, don't pick up their gifts, dash one of the warnings I've heard all my life rings clearly in my head. Are these fruit really a gift though? There are certainly cherry trees in these woods, and though I can't see any right now that doesn't mean that there are none close enough for this to be a natural occurrence. I eat the berries and continue on my way. In our village, adults tell children what to do in the woods before they are old enough to venture out there. Before they're even old enough to walk, in some cases. If you take their gifts, listen to the whispers in the forest, insult them, or leave the trail for any reason then you could be taken. Some children who are taken are replaced by false, corrupted versions. Some are merely removed, never to be seen again. They never replace the adults. As a teenager teetering between childhood and adulthood, I wonder whether their rules would allow them to send a replica back in my stead. I wonder if they would even want to. The whispers started up a few minutes later. I can't remember if they alarmed me the first time, but I've been on this trail many times before today. The whispers are not things that we should listen to, but despite that, or perhaps more likely because of that, they are beautifully melodic. I've heard riddles, insults, and compliments over the years, each one in a compellingly sweet tone. I've walked these paths so many times that by all rights I shouldn't have tripped. But whether due to them or my own poor coordination, I fall hard and slide down the slope to the left of the track. No matter how you look at it, I'm definitely off the path now. I hear giggling all around, though I can't see a single source. Oh yeah, you think you're funny. You really think you're clever? Your tricks are stupid and you're stupid and you just dash. The trees creak and I feel the pressure in the air change. The light shifts and I hear a cracking noise behind me. I spin round and I see her. Beautiful, horrific, and altogether inhuman. I sob as I fall to her feet. I didn't mean it. I whisper. I didn't mean it. It was just the last rule that I had not broken. I haven't been honest with you, I suppose. Not entirely. I told you of the rules that adults tell children in these parts, and I let you believe that I was told these myself, rather than only ever hearing them from parents who were actually concerned about their kids. I told you how I ate the berries and left off just how much I hoped they were a gift. That I tripped was perfectly true, but the additional truth that I had fully intended to purposefully leave the path at a later point would have shifted the tone somewhat. Why did you come? She asked me. Whilst parents told their children the rules of the woods, what mother who truly cared about their child's safety would not only fail to catch them, but actively allow their child to walk this way time and time again. My mother told me that you take people and send them back all wrong. That a good, pure child had been taken from her, and I was sent back instead. There was a pause, and I could hear creaking as she breathed. That is not the truth of the matter. I know that. I know it. I have no memories of the woods before the age of eight, and she'd already started telling this story by then. So I know it's just a story and that I didn't come from here. But this is still where I want to be. I'd stop crying, perhaps because there was no longer any point. I'd made my case and she would either choose to accept me or she wouldn't. This choice cannot be undone and our ways are not like the ones you've known. We are not what you might consider kind. I shrugged. Neither were they. All children learn the rules of the woods, but so too do all adults. They take alarming truths and flavor them with suspicion and fear. They use stories of the forest to hide truths from inside the village in a place that no neighbor will dare to scrutinize too carefully. 
It is true that the beings in the forest will steal those who break their simple rules. But it is also true that sometimes, every so often, there are those of us who want to be stolen.